Does it have more than 10 pins? No, it doesn't. So it's not you. Does it have a pin on four sides? Yes, it does. And you're out. Is ground on pin four? Yes, it is. Is it an 80, tiny 85? You got it. It's, it's fun. fun. Let's, Let's play, play another, another round. round. Welcome to Kuvulu, the sorcery of copper. From time to time, I have to reverse engineer boards. And one of the very first steps is to identify the components on it. I already explained how to do that in a previous episode. But basically, you just have to read the top markings on the chips. But sometimes, device manufacturers remove these markings. Their goal is to prevent you from copying their design, or at least make it a bit harder. All we know in this case is that the chip is in a QFN package, 4mm by 4mm, and it has 24 pins, and is very probably doing some computation, so it's a microcontroller. And now it's time to find a magic part, and for that I often go to distributor websites because they have a useful search engine. For example here the one from DigiKey, but I use multiple of them at the same time because not every distributor has all the parts, and you might miss exactly the one you're looking for. We go to microcontrollers, and then we simply select what we know. This is a QFN package with 24 pins, so let's use this one, and we know it's a 4x4. And there are several 4x4 QFN packages, they have different names, VQFN, and that's probably it. And here we see that we have 572 results. And the next step is simply download the data sheet and look if the pinout matches. For example, let's take the one from the C8051F family, and if we go to the data sheet somewhere, there is the pinout. And now we compare the pinout. First, we identify where the pins are connected to. And if we overlay the pinout, we see it doesn't match, particularly the VDD pin. It's not on one of the VCC pins we've identified. And because we don't have the pin one marking, we verify it with all four rotations, but none of them match. Now we can have a look at the next data sheet and again compare the pinout. But because there are too many results, it would be exhaustive to try all of them. So instead, we could refine our search using more attributes. For example, if we know the voltage or the operating voltage of the device, we could select that. Or if we know that it is connected to USB or to any kind of other peripherals, we could also select the connectivity. But be aware that distributors don't have all the information from all the parts. So if you select something, you might exclude the one you're looking for simply because the distributor doesn't have this information. So be aware of that. What's an important part in searching is experience. This microcontroller is used as a one wire device. So it gets the power from the same line as it communicates to, and it has a budget of around one milliamp. This is very, very low. And there is one series of microcontroller which is well known for its ultra low power connectivity. This is the MSP430. So you cannot search for ultra low power, but with experience, you learn this kind of information. And now we only have 48 candidates. So let's apply it and let's have a look at the data sheet. And when we overlay the pinout and rotate it a bit, we see it perfectly matches. The VCC and ground pins align, and we even have the test and debug pins. Now we've identified the microcontroller. What threw me a bit off track while I was searching for it is that this device operates at 5 volts. But according to the datasheet, the absolute maximum voltage is 4.1 volts. So while I was applying filters, it excluded this microcontroller from beginning on. But opening PDFs and comparing the pinout is a very manual process. And I was wondering if it's not possible to automate this step. All we need is the pinout information in a machine-readable format. But PDFs are meant for humans, so let's see what other files we can use. If we have a look at which files the vendors provide, which describe or which include the pinout of the chip in a machine-readable fashion, we often find two kind of files. The EBIS models and the BSDL models. Let's have a look at some EBIS files. This is what's inside. And then there is a section about the pins. So we have the pin number, the pin name, and then the model name. And the model name gives you what kind of type the pin is. Is it, for example, a ground pin, a power pin, an IO pin, and so on. And later in the files, we have a voltage and current characteristics of the pins or of the models. For example, here for ground clamp. And these are machine readable. EBIS files are often used for simulation and are kind of an alternative to SPICE models. 
but we are not interested in this part. We are only interested in the pinout. On the other hand, we have BSDL files, and this is how one looks like. If we open it, we have sometimes the package information, but most importantly, we have a pin description. For example, VDD1 is a typed linkage, RA1 is a type input output. If we go a bit below, we find the pin names, the pin number, and here we have a register description. This is meant for microcontrollers which have a JTAG debug interface. You probably already use JTAG to program the chip or read or write registers or debug it. But JTAG offers you another feature which is called boundary scanning. And this is why we have BSDL file, boundary scanning description language. What this allows you to do is drive the pins in the chip from the debug interface without needing any kind of firmware. So you can test the connectivity of the chip or the boards very early on in the production process. But we are only interested in the pinout, and this is the information we will extract. But you might be wondering why I didn't talk about CAT files yet, the one which we use in our EDA tools, the symbols and footprints. The problem is that there are too many CAT tools and the vendors just can't support all of them. But since a few years this started to change, some of them now provide BXL files, which can be converted to models for your EDA tool. If we have a look at a BXL file, once decompressed, we can see the footprint, the symbol, and a component description. And there we can find the pinout with the pin number, the pin name, and the pin type. But some vendors stop providing these files. They now force you to go through the Ultra Librarian website, where you can't even download the BXL file anymore, only the exported versions. And only humans can download the models, one by one. This is because they want to create and resell profiles of engineers, and it seems to be very profitable. You have several companies based on this business model. They even manage to put themselves on distributor pages. After scraping numerous websites, downloading a lot of models, parsing the files, putting the pinouts in a database, and building a search engine, we have ICID, the Integrated Circuit Identifier. So let's try it out and see if it can identify our chip. First, we select the package. We know it's a QFN. Then we select the pin count. We select 24 pins and 25 pins because there might be an additional exposed pad in the middle. And now comes the magic where we can define the pinout. So let's use the information we have about the power and ground pins. This is where we've identified them and they most likely are. And we see that we have zero remaining parts. This is because we've only used one orientation, but we actually don't know in which orientation it is. So let's remove that and let's pull all four orientation possibilities. We have to wait a bit until it finds a matching pinout. But there we have it. It came up with six solutions. And actually they are all pretty similar. This is because I get the files from different sources and the pinout might be slightly different. If we click on one of them, we have a representation of the pinout and we can match if it works. Here we have the VCC and ground pins, again a ground pin, and also we can see if the GPIO match. For example, these are the test pads and programming pads. And there we have it. And we, if we look at the other ones, they're all pretty much the same. It's just, again, the names of the pins which are different because the model is different. And sometimes we don't know if it's an input or an output. That's why you should concentrate on power and ground first. But there we have it. Within a couple of minutes, we've already identified our chip. And just because we can, let's try with another board. This is a very basic relay module. And on the left, we have again a microcontroller which has no markings. At least it has the pin one indication. And the first step is to identify where the pins are connected to so we know its type. And now let's search for the part. So this is in a TSOP package, so in the subcategory, and we have 20 pins. There is no hidden exposed pad. We still have 1303 candidates, which is too much, but we will just add the pinout information. For now, we start with the ground and power pin. And we already limit to 61 candidates. It's still too much. Let's add another pin to see if it works better. For example, pin 10. We know it's an output, so either it's an output or it's a bidirectional pin. And here we have it. We are already restricted to nine parts, which is small enough. Let's have a look at the first one. And it can't be this one because here we have even more grounds and more VVD, VDD pins. So that's not the right one. If we look at the next one, this could actually match the pin, the input and output match, also the programming pins like the reset pin and the ICP pin, they match. So it could be an MS-51. Um, this is also MS-51, other information. Then we have N76, so this is a Nouveauton chip, and this also matches. We have the same thing. 
we have the input output rich match and then the programming ping reset and icp clock which are there and the power pin also match and we also have these ones for example the stm 8 s003 which also matches reset swim which is just another programming interface and then we have the power pin but also this one compared to the other it has a power input pin v cap which is used to regulate the voltages of the internal core now on our board v cap is not populated but I have another relay module where there is a capacitor and the top marking of the chip has not been removed. And there you can see that originally this module used an STM8 S003 F3P microcontroller. And very probably afterwards they changed it to an N76 E003 because it is pin compatible and it is cheaper and it doesn't require the V cap on this pin. And this is why they didn't populate it on the board. So we've identified the microcontroller, but also this tool has become a lot more powerful, particularly in these times of chip shortages. Now you can look for pin compatible devices and you don't have to respin complete boards and retest them. Just use another part which fits your requirements with the same form factor and with the same pins where you want them. And then you just have to tweak a bit of firmware so it fits on the new microcontroller. And we've seen that they replaced the STM8S with an N76, but they could as well use the MS51. And although ICID has been designed with reverse engineering in mind, it turned out that it can be used for much more and probably have even more ideas. But until then, enjoy.